So my name is um, Isra, and I am part of the ICRA team. Um, these webinars are for anybody. It's not just for students and not just for teachers or parents of ICRA Network. So a little background, ICRA Network, um, for those that don't know, is an online tutoring school to learn Arabic, Quran, Islamic studies. Um, the company is, we're based in Boston. Um, where our guest is today, um, but our students are all over the world. Um, we have kids, adults, um, and that's who we are. So we've started this monthly webinar series called Ikra Interviews, and it mainly started because when coronavirus started, all the Islamic conferences ended, all the halakas stopped, all of the meeting of community and seeing our brothers and sisters in the masajid stopped. But we still wanted to connect. We still want to learn. We still want to hear from, you know, and learn from others. So we thought this was our way, our small way of kind of bringing the Muslim community together um, with people just doing everyday Muslims, doing great things. We don't have shuf, we don't have anything like that. These are people that are just in our community who are doing really great things that we can learn from and be inspired by. So today I am really excited and honored to welcome our guest, uh, Sister Autumn Allen. So I'll give you a little background on um, Miss Allen. So Autumn has been and currently is, correct Autumn, you are currently also in the trenches, <laughs> homeschooling mom for over 13 years to her four children, mashallah. Three children, <laughs> I can't take credit. Yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> you have four daughters, but you have three girls. Three, yeah. You have a busy house though still, you have a very yes. busy house, mashallah. Um, she's worked with children and families in the Boston area for over 10 years, coordinating teaching classes, co-ops, mentorships, book groups, and much more, much more. And that's how I met her too. Um, she's an educator, a writer, a reviewer of books for children and young adults. She is an independent scholar of children's literature. Um, she holds two master's degrees, one in children's lit from Simmons, a master's from Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a bachelor's in literature from Yale. She is currently writing her first novel and is the 2020-2021 recipient of the prestigious Boston Public Library Writer in Residence Fellowship. So first, congratulations on the fellowship. Thank that you. is a very exciting, mashallah, incredible accomplishment. But that's not why you're here. Today we are talking homeschooling. Um, many of us have started, are about to start, um, have never done this before, or are veterans and are looking for some extra tips. So with so many different names, we're just kind of the umbrellas homeschooling, but there's online, there's remote, there's distance learning, unschooling, whatever name your family um, chooses to use, but we're talking about schooling that takes place at home. Um, to learn, also I'm going to put um, Autumn's website in the chat and it will be on Facebook to get in touch with her or to check out her website and see what she's up to. Um, so Autumn, let's just get into it now, because I know everybody wants to know, how or why did you start homeschooling? How did you come to homeschooling so many years ago? Yeah, so the answer to that really um, reflects my philosophy about homeschooling. I had my first child and um, had a nice long maternity leave, and then I went back to work part-time. My husband at the time was a doctoral student, so he was able to care for her when I was at work. Then he graduated and he was you know, going in for a full-time job and my job that where I had been part-time was asking me to come back full-time um, and they wanted to promote me and everything. And, um, you know, I really had to make a decision. Well, we, you know, my husband and I had to make a decision. Um, you know, are we going to pay someone else to take care of our child or um, is one of us going to stay home? So I just couldn't tear myself away from my child. She was one and a half and um, I just wanted to be there all the time. So um, I decided to leave my job and stay home with her and my husband went to work full time. So from that, you know, in the 
early years, the kids are learning so much every day, you know, and I'm not talking about reading and writing. I'm talking about speaking and walking and, you know, like all the things that they learn to do to be participants in this world, you know, so you just see all this growth. And um, from that, it just felt like, well, you know, if I could teach her, teach her to, to walk and talk, why can't I teach her to read, you know? Um, everything else just seemed like it would be a natural progression and could happen within the context of home and the context of parenting. So um, I did have two friends who were homeschooling at the time and their children were two years older than mine. So at around age three was when I had to sort of think, okay, preschool or like start you know, doing yeah. a few learning activities. And so my friend's children were five. And so they were doing kind of kindergarten -y stuff. And I didn't really see the difference. And so I was like, okay, let's start doing that too. That was way too early. Please don't do that. <laughs> Leave yeah. your three-year-olds alone. Let them play. But um, I, you know, I saw that, it, you know, it wasn't that hard um, to teach the things they need to learn. And so I just figured as long as I feel like I'm doing as good a job as school would do, why not continue? So I just, you know, I guess I kind of eased into it from maternity leave, really. <laughs> it sounds, um, a lot of what you're saying is, I think a lot of what all of us go through as a new parent with mm -hmm. that first child, mm -hmm. um, there's so much doubt about our own parenting that we tend to kind of look and think, oh, someone else can do it better or everybody else can do it better. I read the books. And three is really critical. Now looking back, yes, three seems very young, but I know at that yeah. time, that mm -hmm. new three-year-old is learning words mm -hmm. and they're doing so much and they're babbling and, and they're just emerging. So you feel, wow, okay, they need school. Yes, they need mm -hmm. preschool, they need nursery, they need something. Right. So, um, so you decided at that point that we're not gonna do this formal preschool you had already decided with the first it wasn't like she yeah. went and then you took her out at some point yeah no because I knew you know the schools that I went to were you know world-class schools and so they cost a lot of money and my mom taught there and that's how we got to go there without you know breaking the bank um, but I wasn't a teacher even though I went to the school of education I studied like cultural psychology yeah. um, so I wasn't prepared to either hand over our entire salary to you know one of these quality preschools or um you know take chances with a less you know um a lower quality school so I felt like you know I've been through it I I kind of know what they need to learn and um. I can just do it myself it it turned out to be more difficult than I thought it would be. <laughs> I was very confident going in. You know, my yeah. goals were like, she's going to be a half of a, she's going <laughs> to know five languages, she's going to go to Harvard, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I had it all like planned out yeah. in my dreamland. Yeah. It, you know, it never, nothing turns out the way you imagine when no. it involves someone else because you don't have complete control. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think you said something that's so telling though. I mean, you went to, uh, you got your master's from Harvard Graduate School of Education, even though it's not directly teaching. But I mean, I think as a parent, we question no matter how much education we've gotten, if we are enough for our kids. So I, you know, there's a lot of parents probably watching, or maybe we'll watch this later, who are like, I didn't go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I barely like finished a couple of years of college and now I'm teaching my kids. Am I qualified? So what would you, what would you kind of say to that? Yeah, I've been there. I question myself all throughout, you know, um, because really uh, there's no strategy for teaching, you know, teaching is relationship based. You sort of form a relationship with your student or child or, you know, whoever the person is. And based on that relationship, you're able to you know, facilitate learning. Um, you, you know, it's not like open their brain, pour knowledge in and, you know, out comes this yeah. educated person. It's, yeah. um, you're teaching them how to learn, you're teaching them how to study, you're teaching them to under understand themselves, you know, so that yeah. they can know what kind of learner they are and when they need to take breaks and, you know, how to sort of buckle down when they need to and, um, it's skills that you're teaching more than the actual knowledge set. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I questioned myself every day for the past like 
15 yeah. years. And, you know, I finally, what I finally realized was I'm living by my values. And so whatever they did or didn't get was not a result of my incompetence. It was a result of what I placed an emphasis on, you know? Mm. So um, I remember one time my sister was saying, you know, like, when's the last time you did their hair? <laughs> because yeah. their, their braids had been in for like yeah. months and I just, yeah. you know, I just didn't have the time. Um, yeah. And she said, well, that's okay. You know, they're eating homemade yogurt and, you know, you should just give them yeah. a t-shirt yeah. that says, yeah. don't look at my hair. You should see my insides, you know, <laughs> like yeah. I'm eating yeah. sprouted beans and, you know, totally. it's yeah. about what you're emphasizing. So you're mm. never going to fit everything in, but what mm. you value you will, you know, base your days around that. I really love that because it just makes you feel okay. It almost gives you a, like a forgiveness, like just don't worry, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much about lowering the expectations, but raising what's priority for your family. What's right. the, what's the priority and focus on that. That's kind of what so I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, you can type them. We'll get them at the end. We'll go through them, okay? Thank you so much. Um, so many new families to homeschooling this year. So mm -hmm. many. <laughs> um, uh, many not by choice, uh, more because of the situation that we're in with the public health crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think? Um, how can we talk to the parents who are going kind of through this, like, this mental shift of, you know, yes, I, I love homeschooling. I think it's great. My kids have never done it though. And I've never been in that position, but here I am. Um, I think it's so much more mental than it is physical. That's what I'm starting to realize. I am a first time now homeschooler myself. Um, and I went through this. Yay. <laughs> talk to me, talk to me at the end of the year. Maybe we'll have to do a roundup in yes. May and see how we're handling it. But mm -hmm. I started with the whole which curriculum, which this, which that. And mm -hmm. it's only been two weeks, but I can already start to see that, okay, just, it's more like, it, it's more about what's in my head and what I'm reflecting. So what is your advice to all these new parents who have suddenly found themselves um, homeschooling for the first time? Sure. So I would say three things. One is um, think of it as a shift to full-time parenting. Um, and we know that even if you're only parenting five hours a day, you know, your kids are coming home from school, you're helping them with homework, you're doing dinner, bedtime, that's exhausting, right? We all know that. So think about doing that all day from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. It's a, it's a full-time job and it's exhausting. So think about when can you take breaks? from each other you know when can you take a break yeah. and when can the kids get a break from you um you want to be sort of relaxed enough to let yourselves and your children feel like sort of independent entities and not like you're constantly in a power struggle like you're telling them what to do all day long because mm -hmm. that's just exhausting for them and frustrating for you and you know does not end well, trust me. <laughs> so um, you want to sort of live together harmoniously and sort of think about um, creating an atmosphere where, you know, expectations are known and clear, but it's not a constant power struggle. A second thing I would think about is what is your role as a parent? Um, and in my opinion, our role as a parent is to prepare our children for adulthood, right? Um, so whatever that means to you, um, you know, in your society and in your, you know, philosophy is that should determine, you know, how your days go. So, um, you know, you may in the, in the moment, you may think that this kid has to get this math worksheet done or else yeah. I'm not teaching them. But mm. in reality, if you look at the big picture is fighting to tears over worksheets, a part of your, you know, parenting role is that, you know, is that getting you closer to the goal of preparing them for life? Um, so I would say, you know, think about things like patiently teaching them study habits, you know, teaching them how to handle frustration, um, teaching them how to do chores and, you know, manage responsibilities. Um, also let them apprentice you in your adult responsibilities. So don't think like, oh, once the kids go to bed, then I can do the X, Y, and Z. No, like do the things you need to do and show them 
how it gets done so that they can understand, you know, this is what's going to be expected of them as adults and these are the skills they're going to need. And that goes for, you know, paying bills, meal planning, you know, um, whatever it is. Um, and then the third thing I would say is to really think about expanding your idea of what learning looks like. Um, so we think of learning as sitting with a book or sitting, you know, doing, you know, a math program or something. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of learning, um, but there are so many kinds of learning and children are learning all day long, whether we want them to or not. <laughs> you know, if they see us, yeah. you know, uh, eating emotionally, you know, like I'm sad, so I'm gonna have a piece of cake. They're learning from that sadly. <laughs> um, if they yeah. see us delaying our prayers, you know, they're learning that it's not such a big deal, you know. Um, so whatever we do as we're living our days in front of them, they're learning from that. And then, you know, how we interact with them about the things we're trying to get them to do, they're learning from that as well. So it's not just the content of what they're learning. Just think about like how everything they see and experience all day long, what that's teaching them and mm -hmm. how you can sort of facilitate an atmosphere that shows them the habits you'd like them to have. I really love a um, couple of things. Well, that first thing that you said, it's a shift to full-time parenting. That really hits home because it really is true. I mean, when they leave 8, 7.30 in the morning to go to school and then you pick them up around 2.30, yeah, there is that time for either you go to work outside of the house or you have your work inside of the house or you just have your own time to kind of, you know, work on, on what you want to or what you need to. And so that's a, that's a huge mental shift actually to say, okay, now we are, it is full-time parenting. You are the teacher, but you've always also been the teacher. I mean, you are a parent. And I like the other thing about setting kind of the expectations that just because they're at home doing school doesn't mean you have to delay what you are doing or what you need to get done also in terms of your work. It has to kind of work, you know, together. And I think that's important for kids to role model, to see that, you know, we're not waiting for you to go to sleep before we start our work. You know, ours is important too. And so I think that's really, that was a great point. I really appreciated that. Um, okay. We are taking questions that are coming in. We will check them a little bit towards the end. This is about an hour um, webinar. So around seven and about a quarter to the next hour, we'll check them, okay? Just so we know, because I know there's a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> um, now about the kids shift. Um, I know you can't look in a glass ball and tell us what you think is going to happen, mm -hmm. but, um, for kids who have been, did you have a child who had gone to conventional traditional school and then they started homeschooling? Did you have someone that went the other way or? or so no? all of my children, yeah. they all started out homeschooling. I have one mm -hmm. child who went to school for two years. So that year mm -hmm. that she came home from school was an adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one child who is going to school now for the first time in high school. <laughs> so that's gonna be uh -huh. interesting. Wow. Um, so, but as far as what kids who are coming from school to homeschooling can expect, it's, um, it's, it's, it's maturity that they're going to need. And so we really have to be patient with them because when you send them into a classroom, everyone around them is at least supposed to be doing this one task, right? Listening to the teacher, you know, doing the class activity, whatever it is that's mm -hmm. happening in the class, they know that they're at least, that's, you know, that's why they're there, that's what they're supposed to be doing. When they're at home, they don't have that environmental cue and pressure, you know, from peers and from like the sole role of the teacher being, I am only here to teach you, you know? So they don't have yeah, all of yeah. that um, environment sort of forcing them to do that work. So when mm -hmm. you think about it, you know, if you're a kid sitting there with the paper in front of them and they're just daydreaming or they're getting distracted with their toys or they're like, can I have a snack? Cause the kitchen's right there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, um, yeah. It can be frustrating for us, you know, but we have to understand from their perspective, like, you know, this is part of the reason people put kids in a room together and sort of, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, make them listen is yeah. because the pressure um, sort of forces that activity. So, um, 
teaching them willpower, you know, you can use a timer, you can say, we're going to work for mm -hmm. 15 minutes straight, you know, and if you, if you don't get distracted during that 15 minutes, then you can have whatever it is. I mean, if they don't need, you know, um, motivational things, I wouldn't yeah. like start with it. But if you see that your child is easily distracted, or you see that, you know, they're not adjusting well, um, you know, just got to pull out different tricks and tips. And what you're teaching them is not like, you need to like, sit down and listen and you know you need to teach them okay listen i get it yeah. you know you're home it can be hard think about us you know like the dishes need to be done are we running yeah. to do the dishes no we're like checking facebook and then we're like okay i guess i have Never. to do it you know yeah. right yeah. so just think of them as small people and you know this is a big adjustment it's kind of like uh, how for me the adjustment of going from high school to college was you know because in high school mm -hmm your homework is due, you know, like day after day and, you know, you have classes every day, you're on campus at the same time, you know, in college, it's just like, do your work or not. The teacher's not going to yeah. chase you down, you know, <laughs> like you yeah. have to organize your time, get out of the cafeteria where everyone's laughing and joking and go to the library, you know, like you're in charge of your time. Yeah. So um, homeschooling is a little more independent like that. Um, yeah another Which thing that they have to them, yeah. yeah absolutely it's a it's an important yeah. life skill Taking um in charge of their own be. yeah learning i remember yeah. you had um i'd learned something from you a while ago about homeschooling that i oh it's still to this day i actually use it at home i started using yeah. it now i started it during the pandemic when we were all locked down and we didn't know what was going on um but a great tip that you had given was about kind of going over with each kid, like the expectations for the day, just having like mm -hmm. three simple goals, yeah. just so you're kind yeah. of both on the same page. And I really took that to heart. And I have mm -hmm. noticed a big change, even mentally with the kids, because if they can at least get those three tasks done, mm -hmm. it feels yeah. like, okay, today was a win. We're, we're yeah. doing okay. Yeah. Because you forget, you really do forget what you've done right. during the day. So, yeah. So I do, I do like that tip. Um, so what does a typical homeschool day in your house look like or, or week, whichever one? I yeah. Know. Okay. So I'm going to preface uh -huh. this by saying, I do not recommend what my day looks like. <laughs> I will share with you what I do, but it's, <laughs> I mean, this is just the routine that we've gotten into. So basically I've discovered about myself that if I don't get my work done first thing in the morning, I am grumpier with the kids, less patient because mm -hmm. I feel like, come on guys, you got to hurry up so I can get to my stuff. So instead I do my work first. So I get up mm -hmm. in the morning. I try to get up, you know, earlier than them, at least earlier than they're hungry. Um, and I do some mm -hmm. work for a few hours. I do my morning routine, read some Quran, do a little exercise um, journal. And then uh, the kids slowly wake up. I don't really check on them. My kids are 10, 13 and 16. So, you know, it would be different if they were younger, but um, they kind mm -hmm. of hang out in their room. And then usually the youngest wanders into my room asking for breakfast around 930 in the morning. And I'll usually I'm in the middle of something. So I'll kind of stall a little bit. Can't you find some cereal? Can't you find a bagel? And mm -hmm. then if that doesn't work, I'll get up and help them find some breakfast. Um, mm -hmm. I try to use the momentum from breakfast to keep them out of their room, you know, send them maybe to like get dressed, but then come right back out, you know, it's school time. Come on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then around 1030, I'm really like, okay, you know, time is ticking. Let's sit down and do some studying. Um, the middle mm -hmm. and eldest sit down, sit down with uh, independent work um, while I teach the youngest for a few hours. And then when I'm finished with the youngest, then I check in with the eldest too. And um, I'll do some instruction with my middle schooler. Um, and at some point in that time, lunch happens whenever people say they're too hungry to continue, <laughs> you know, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really a schedule yeah. keeper. I like making schedules and writing them and putting yeah. them on the wall, but I'm not very good at following them. So it's they kind of pretty. like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I feel organized. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then when everyone's just like had enough, you know, they can't take any more studying, then I'll check that at least enough got done that we can call it a day and then um yeah. if i have work to finish i'll go to my room and finish that if not i'll try and take them outside um go for a walk or go to the park and then they have free time until dinner and yeah. then after dinner they stay up way too late laughing and joking mm -hmm. and doing whatever they do yeah. i don't know yeah. how they stay up so late yeah. and then they go to sleep and we repeat 
Um, so well, those are the home, home days. Home every day? Yeah. So, are, are you so every day or no? A couple of days. So pre-quarantine, there would be a few days a week where we would go out for most of the day. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be, I would try to keep that to a maximum of two days a week because I would always aim to still do a little bit of study time at home on those days. But it, you know, by the middle of the year, it was just like, okay, get up, pack, we got to go, you know. Um, so I try to keep three days of the week clear for staying home to study. That's now that they're older, you know, like when they were yeah. younger, it didn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us are now in, the, a lot of us have small spaces. We don't have mm -hmm. the luxury of beautiful classroom setups, Pinterest style mm -hmm. with the fancy desks and the nice little carts that organize. I'd love to have all of them, but um, mm -hmm. most of us don't have that space for it because we have our own, our own office space we have to create too. So what are like your top supplies? Like if you said, you know what? you really need this to kind of at least, you know, the, the basic, what's the really basic minimum that you, that you think every homeschooler would have that would really kind of help them? Yeah. So I know we have a lot of international folks and um, I, one of the, one of my hesitations in moving overseas is I would have to know what the library looks like, what the public mm -hmm. library is like. So yeah. I don't know what access you all have to libraries because, you know, being able to take out books and return them and not always have to buy the books that you want to read has mm -hmm. been essential for me. So um, library books and uh, crate. Each child in my house mm -hmm. has a, just a crate, like a milk crate. And that's where they keep their books. And then we have an extra crate for the library books. And that's, that's the only thing that has stayed consistent over years. You know, I've tried different, we have like an extra room in our house, which we've tried couches, we've tried floor mats, we've tried desks and tables. I mean, every year it's something different, but they always end up on the living room couch or, you know, in yeah. a bed <laughs> most often yeah. <laughs> doing yeah. their work. Yeah. So really it's just to keep things organized to know that, okay, when it's time to work with this child, we pick up their crate and everything they need for their school day is in there. Um, and then the library crate so that the library books don't get lost, which they used to do a lot. <laughs> That's, I love that that crate because you can actually kind of stack them too. Yeah. So a yeah. lot a lot of the homes, you know, we do have a, a lot of people from overseas and stuff, and this the ho homes are not like the American homes. They are mm -hmm. they're tiny space is really limited. So I like the idea of the crate thing. You can kind of stack it up, and you can kind of pick it up and then just go anywhere in the house exactly. where you need to go. I'm realizing that quickly that, you know, yes, we kind of try to create a little desk space but mm -hmm. somehow my kids end up in the kitchen they end up yeah. in my room they end up in their brother's room like they're just all over so yeah. I think that's a that's a great idea I love that just kind of getting something that they have everything and then okay if you want to work there just pick it up and take it so yeah. it's really great um so everything is online a lot of people are doing the online school but um I have, I'm really having a tough time with this, um, the new, the way they teach math now. It's, mm. it's so different than how we yeah. learned. Um, but I want, you know, them to learn it the way that the school is teaching them or the way that, you know, they're learning it now. Um, the new math, I guess they call it. Um, so I've been going to Khan Academy a lot. <laughs> I really love that thing. It's like five minute videos and it's really I like that they're learning from someone else. It seems like yeah. it's easier for them to listen to someone else. So what are your like go-to online resources that anybody can like access? Do you have anything like that that are uh, like helpful for, for teaching more or tutoring more about a certain um, lesson or skill? Yeah. 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 Even grammar. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly for online, I mostly look for classes that can get certain subjects off my plate. So for example, mm -hmm. you know, like my kids will write for me, but they won't edit for me. You know, I'll say, mm -hmm. you know, you're missing some punctuation, you're missing this and that. And I'm like, oh, you know what I meant. It doesn't matter, <laughs> you know. So to <laughs> avoid that whole struggle every single time, um, I've enrolled them in writing classes. And the cheapest ones I found are on a site called Home to Teach. And I'll type it in home number two teach.com and they are um 
they do six week classes and they focus on like getting your writing perfect, you know, like revising okay. and, and right. editing and, you know, the grammar and the punctuation and all of that. So if you have a child who's just not into um, detail and, you know, going mm -hmm. over their work, I found that helpful. Um, for math, it was always difficult to, you know, have the time to sit with each child, you know, for enough time every day. So um, I found that teaching textbooks, um, and I'll take that in. And for I those on for... Facebook, we will be, um, oh. we'll copy them into Facebook after, so no okay. worries. Yeah. Um, teaching textbooks is a, you know, it's a resource where the textbook is teaching directly to the child. So you don't mm -hmm. have to sit with them and explain to them, you know, the whole time. It works pretty well for my kids, even my very math averse, math -averse um, child. And um, you can get a one-year subscription to do it online, or you can print out the PDFs. Um, you know, I... I I, I'm not is for math you're saying you like yeah to teaching math. textbooks okay. is specifically for math yeah um and these are just you know like basically my criteria is does it make it easier for me <laughs> to homeschool yeah. you know number so, one that's yes. number one <laughs> <laughs> yes so I'm not saying like teaching textbooks is like the quality math curriculum yeah. out there I'm just saying like if you're having a hard time and you're struggling and you need some help yeah. it helps um yeah. And then just reading about different philosophies. Oh, outschool.com is also a helpful resource. They have teachers um, from all walks of life teaching different subjects from cooking to writing to uh, all kinds of subjects, almost anything you can think of. And they yeah. have semester long courses, they have one day courses, they have flex courses, um, you can just do a search. Um, try to pay attention to the reviews that the teachers have, because it's really, you know, hit or miss. But um, usually it's pretty affordable. So um, you can try something out. And then I just read about I have read over time about many different philosophies um, of education. Charlotte Mason, unschooling, yeah. project-based. Mm -hmm. And even if I don't like become a dedicated follower of those, just having those ideas in my head has helped to sort of put things in perspective. Um, so I recommend those for parents. Yeah, um, we've tried out school before. I did love it. And it, they have some quirky classes. We did yeah. a my daughter did um, um, like a money management class, mm -hmm. which I thought was great because they yeah. don't teach really money management. They teach what money is. Right. They teach what a quarter is and the math mm -hmm. of it. But um, so that's kind of nice. You can also take classes that are not offered at all in these traditional curriculums. Right. Yeah, I do love those. So we'll get those up, all of them. Um, I am going to start going through some of these questions. Okay. Let's just start, let's see. Um, how do we deal with reading and writing aversion? She's saying specifically boys, but I, I mean, I, I have seen this with my tween girl too. So, so um, what, are your, what are your tips, any advice for reading aversion? kids who don't want to really read books are not interested or I can offer some of my advice too that I've worked with yeah. but I'd love to hear what you, yeah. what you think. Um, I find that a lot of kids who think they don't like to read just haven't found the books that speak to them um, and there are so many different kinds of books out there and there are so many books that you know reflect different experiences. Um, a lot of times the books we have are reflecting one particular experience like a white middle class you know non-Muslim you know mm -hmm. experience and kids can't always relate to that you know. Um, so if you find books that reflect who they are some of the experiences they have that can help. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like my whole, you know, children's literature research yes. area. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's important. And then um, I use audiobooks and I use reading aloud. No matter how old the person is, you can read aloud to them. If your mm -hmm. child is 18, you can read to them, you know, and you can read picture books to them, you know. Yeah. I'll sit my, my 16 year old down and say, listen to this picture book, you know, and I'll phrase it like, you know, I'm reviewing it, tell yeah. me what you think. But, you know, yeah. sometimes it's just yeah. fun to. <laughs> um, so you can read chapter books to them. Sometimes what I would do is um, 
I would have two copies of the same book and I would read it aloud to them while they read along. Um, and, you know, so you just get creative. If you can find audiobooks online or, you know, through different apps, um, those can help. Uh, it's once they get sort of drawn in, they have to see a reason to read. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether it's nonfiction and they're into actually learning about, you know, science or astro yeah. you know, mm -hmm. astronomy or whatever, um, find what interests them and show them that books can get them um, yeah. closer to what they're interested in. So I love that. And I'll be posting, um, we'll be posting these uh, tips on our, our Facebook page, but um, so, I mean, that's why I'm kind of like typing furiously some of the stuff you're saying. But I love that about um, audiobooks. Yes, like I listen to audiobooks all the time. I didn't, oh, yeah. even, I didn't even think about it for the kids, but that's such mm -hmm. a great idea. And representation, if, if kids constantly don't see themselves or people that look like them or, are, or act like them or friends that look like them in books, it's just not interesting to them. They can't relate. So definitely getting books that, um, you know, that they can see themselves in. And um, I've had good luck with uh, graphic novels mm -hmm. also sometimes, it, yeah. you know, which is kind of to that picture book. It's lending to mm -hmm. that idea. You know what? Just, you're just trying to get them into some topic. So, yeah. um, I, and I have read picture books to my, my uh, 14 year old son. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, and I don't do it on the premise of let's read this book together. I kind mm -hmm. of make it all for all the kids and uh, yeah. they'll listen. They'll kind of put their ear in and, and listen. So I, I totally agree. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we're going to be, uh, so what so for Quran and hips, what topics to prioritize for working parents? We want to emphasize Quran. So how are you, I guess, addressing that in your house or how have you addressed that? Um, uh, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you saying you're working and you're, and Quran or Hith is most important? So then what other subjects to also teach or I'm not um, sure? I think it sounds like what topics to prioritize. We want to okay, emphasize. Yes, other Quran. topics. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, in that case, I guess I would sort of interview each child and ask them, you know, what do they want to learn about? What, um, you know, if they have an interest in biology or, you know, if they have different interests, um, I would sort of try and tailor their education around that. So I would have, you know, sort of standard math. And then for reading and writing, I would sort of use their interests to, um, to get them to do the intake of information and the, the expression of information. So basically, mm -hmm. you know, for reading and writing communication, um, you can use unit studies and it doesn't have to be like you're like furiously uh, like researching for them. You can, yeah. depending on their age, you can have them do research, you know, you can make a requirement like you have to have three online references that are reputable, you know, like not some random dot com, but like in an edu or you know some place that clearly you know they they know what they're doing, um, and then you they have to read three books and then you know maybe add something like a hands on component, and then they mm -hmm. have to give you a report you know and you can give them like three week chunks or four week chunks or what however you want to organize it, um, but that is a way to make sure that they're reading and writing. Um, mm -hmm. they're, you know, taking in information, filtering it, and then, you know, expressing it, which is really the main goal of education. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I, I guess, and it's also I a think, way to have them be more independent. Yeah, I think that's exactly what they were asking. I think that their priorities, they do want them to learn Quran right now and Hivs, mm -hmm. but obviously they don't want to you know, just completely put the homeschooling or conventional studies aside. So right. I, yeah, reading and writing is, is paramount. If you, if you read well and you write well, that goes across every, yeah. every subject. So inshallah, that helps them. Um, I'm going to go to Hamad. Let's see. What things are used by you to attract students towards online classes? I'm not sure. Force. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a tough one. I have I have one child who just refuses to take online classes. She just thinks it's 
just not for her. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. If you, if your goal is to just ease them into the practice of studying online and doing online classes, you can start with like one online class, you know, in the fall and then two in the winter and then three, you know, um, sort of ease them into it. Um, but, you know, I basically, with my kids, I just kind of, I talk to them like people and I tell them, and this is, you know, this is kind of an American thing, you know, I didn't, it's not the kind of parent I thought I was going to be, but, you know, I just sit them down and say, look, I'm frustrated. I can't teach you this subject. Here are the options, you know, <laughs> and, you know, online or yeah, you try yeah, and teach yeah. yourself or, you know, um, because it's all, again, relationship based. Like if I'm frustrated as a parent, it, nothing's going to get taught, you know, because I'm just going to be not at my at the top of my game you're gonna feel my frustration and you're gonna take it personally and at the end of the day we're just gonna be slamming doors and like running away from each other and that's not the goal of homeschool right so um yeah. you know i i can i just sit them down and say okay you know these are the options we have um so it's not so much yeah. attracting them to things it's saying like in order to do this and get through this this is what we have to do and you know i'm sorry if you don't like it mm -hmm. how can we make it less painful <laughs> you know yeah that's my strategy Ahmed, i hope that uh, answer your question it sounds like maybe exactly what you're saying which is um this whole online schooling is just not really going working with them right now so how can we kind of uh transition them which i assume this question probably represents a lot of a lot of children out there so i hope yeah. it's like better Another thing um, you can okay. do, sorry, yeah. just thinking there's so many people no, go ahead. Who, who, you know, the kids are going to be, have to be online because you're not actually homeschooling, you're doing school at home, you know, like they're enrolled in school and they have to sit in front of the computer and, you know, listen to their teachers. Um, and that's really hard. So if that's the situation, I would recommend sitting, if you're home, if there's a parent home, hopefully there is, um, sitting next to them, you know, and making it sort of like a the study room, you know, instead of you off in your office or you, you know, like letting them sit there alone, just recognize, yeah, this is painful, you know, like it would be a lot easier yeah. if you could get up in between classes and walk down the hall and, you know, um, I get it. It's mm -hmm. painful. Let's just try and get through it. So you, you can sit down and set up your workspace next to the child so that um, they just, sometimes they just feel just depressed overwhelmed just really like they hate this and yeah. if you can anything yeah. you can do to show like listen I'm with you like I get it I'm sorry you know let's just make the best of it mm -hmm. um, sometimes just sitting with them while they're going through it helps a lot um, I agree we've already had a couple of meltdowns over the online schooling and what has helped is um, just having the child like you said exactly she just came and sat next to me she was on her lesson, but we just kind of held hands. I just held yeah. her hands so she knew I was there mm -hmm. if she needed me and that she wasn't alone. I think a lot of it is maybe the kids feel very alone, you know, they're mm -hmm. just in this classroom by themselves. So um, they're used to being, especially if they're used to going to school, there's, you know, there's a friend next to them sitting, there's a teacher in front of them, and now there's just them in front of the computer, right. um, which I can imagine is quite overwhelming for a young child. So yeah, just kind of sometimes just sitting, just giving them a hug in between and, you know, just reminding them that you're proud of them and they're doing the, their best. So, um, okay, I'm going to go to, let's see, Daoud. So you kind of touched on this one um, in the beginning. In your experience, when are the most effective quiet times, in quotes, <laughs> quiet times, because we all know a house full of children, it's not really quiet. Um, <laughs> To carve out for your own education and work. So that's kind of what you touched on if you want to talk mm -hmm. about that again. And sure. sanity. <laughs> yeah. I've tried different things over the years. So when they were younger and they needed more of my constant attention, like I had to provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I had to, you know, be on them all the time and available all the time, um, I would sort of um, 
as they outgrew their naps, I would try to transition them into not nap time, but quiet time. Just um, from say 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., everyone has to be in a separate room in the house if you have enough space. If you don't have enough space mm -hmm. for separate rooms, just the separate corners or whatever, um, and doing something quiet. I don't want to hear any noise. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, as they got a little older, they'd say, oh, we're getting along. Can we be in the same room? You know, and sometimes I would let that slide. But mostly it was because if everyone was together all day long, there, by the end, there would be fighting. So I would like yeah. break it up so that everyone had a little time off and then come back together to hopefully avoid that. Um, and, you know, that would be a time when I could just rest or, you know, do a little bit of work. Um, now that I'm working more and the kid, my kids are older, I use the times, their, their schedule is a little unconventional. <laughs> they go to bed yeah. quite late and they get up pretty late. So I get up earlier than them and I do my work in the morning before I start my day with them. So um, it's really about sort of chunking out your day and figuring out what's the most productive time for you and what's the most, what's the time of day that they're most able to be cooperative. Because um, when my kids yeah. were younger, the morning they would not cooperate they wanted to do their own thing they got up and they had ideas they were like oh, i want to do this or, or they're in the middle of something and i got so frustrated but i realized you know if i let them do their own thing in the morning they're okay by the afternoon by lunchtime they're done and i can say okay time for you know reading and they'll be like okay you know yeah. So observing their energy and how cooperative they are at what times of day and then observing how your mood shifts, you know, depending on when you're able to get your breaks and your work time. Um, and then mm -hmm. just going with that. So, but yeah, I, you know, so I, I wouldn't um, make it optional. <laughs> I would say, you know, quiet yeah. time is quiet time. Really teach them how mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and Daoud, this um, webinar is actually going to be recorded, so it'll always be up there and it's on a podcast. So, um, Sister Autumn had talked about it at the very beginning, which I now I, I really take it to heart what you said at the very beginning about, because um, I did start doing this, doing your work before the, ho the house wakes up, basically. I've noticed if I don't take that time and get my work done, you do start to kind of resent the rest of the day and you feel yeah. like what, what happened to what about my stuff what about what yeah. I have to get done so it is a big shift in kind of the whole day is that your work is it, is it is separate and you have to keep it separate so if you can wake up even for an hour before everybody else does it does it does make a big difference so I hope yeah. all of that helps um, I know a lot of you asked several uh, questions I'm just trying to get um, people who haven't asked yet. So um, let's see. Actually, Sahira asked a question that I know I, I've heard a lot from other parents too, that it's a good one to address. Your thoughts on e-readers? Um, I think the question is because about screen time, maybe. I'm not sure, but that's what I'm thinking because I know I've heard this question before. What are your thoughts on e-readers to download books? Yeah. Um, so how do you feel about, um, especially for the younger kids, ebooks and things like that? I mean, it is all reading. I can't take that away from it. You know, just like audiobooks are reading, ebooks are reading. I do worry about um, excessive screen time. Um, and I, I just love physical books, you know, but I have the luxury of having a great public library where I can just request books, pick them all up in, in one go and, you know, bring them home. And I have the space at home to keep them in a crate, you know, so um, sometimes that's a luxury. So if you don't have the luxury of access to many books, then definitely I would recommend downloading books um, as long as that device isn't one where they can be reading one minute and on YouTube the next minute. <laughs> Um, so, you know, if it's, you know, if it's specifically for reading and, um, either you're monitoring or, you know, they know, and they, they, they respect that rule. Um, there's nothing wrong with reading on, on a screen. It's I mean, I think if, if the child is fine with it, like you said, it's reading. Um, I have one kid who cannot do the e-readers at all. Mm -hmm. she, she keeps asking to actually hold the book. She keeps mm -hmm. telling me it's not the same. So I think that, you know, it's up to the child. Um, 
I don't know if you're if you feel comfortable responding to this next one, but we're still gonna we'll just bring it up. It says um, recently my child was diagnosed for a mild intellectual disability. I just want to ask, do you recommend homeschooling a special needs child? Do you have any experience with that, or do you know any families who are doing that? Or um, so. I'm going to combine that question with the question that's in the chat about why I decided to send my high schooler to conventional school. Um, uh, okay, great. My high schooler um, has a learning difference and um, mm -hmm. she's very bright and she learned to read very early and, you know, I thought everything was going to go smoothly. So whenever she resisted anything in learning, I just thought it was attitude. And so I came down kind of harsh on it. Um, and looking back, I wish I had looked into it more because it took me a few years of struggle to think, you know, mm -hmm. maybe this isn't just attitude. <laughs> maybe there's something mm -hmm. she can't there's express. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some source of this frustration. And that's when I got her tested. Um, so uh, I do recommend homeschooling a special need child. You are the person who cares most about them. You know them the best. You can observe their behavior at all times. And so um, I think you're in the best position to really um, set them up for success. Um, it does take a lot of dedication and a lot of learning. You're going to have to learn all about their condition and like what's, you know, what are the best practices for them. Um, so if you're up for that, then yes, I think it can work beautifully. Um, I do not regret at all homeschooling my teenager. I think it was the best thing for her. She's very confident and, you know, she, you know, she doesn't have some of the feelings of stigma or, you know, the lack of self-confidence that she might have had if she had gone to school and gotten bad grades and always been, you know, um, labeled or, you know, uh, just wondering why can't I do what the other kids can do, you know, and she's matured at this point to a point where I hope <laughs> she can sort of uh, keep up and um, do just, you know, understand what's needed, understand herself well enough to know how to get things done that need doing. Um, so I think it can be an ideal situation for that. Um, and also, um, I'm not sure where you live, but I know in the in the US, at least for sure, even for homeschoolers, you can get um, uh, resources through the public school system that that you need. So you don't have to go to the conventional school all the time to use um, their resources like language, you know, speech pathologists and you know um, school psychologists and, and school counselors they're, they're still available to you even if you choose to homeschool again I don't know where you live but I just know in the U.S. that we have that that option um, I just want I don't know if you read this comment in the um, in the chat Ibrahima from a Senegal in West Africa mashallah she said I congratulate the presenters here in Africa most of the children don't have the chance to go to school. That's why me and my association help street children to better manage their future. May Allah that's reward amazing. you and help you. That's, um, um, that's life work. That's incredible yeah. work that you're doing. And, um, and you just being here, I hope that we can, you know, help use them how to help them. Mashallah. That's really something. Um, okay. So it looks like we've got, let's see. Um, I think you kind of already answered this at some point did sister Ellen feel that it was more beneficial to send the kids to conventional school and I think you kind of already answered that with your high schooler yeah I'll um, just say I what mean about I, the other two? It, do you think about sending them I guess at some point maybe that's what she's talking about yeah, yeah. I do I mean every year I have the question should we homeschool again or yeah. should, you, should you go to school? It's really a constant question because I'm, you know, I originally decided I can do this better than the schools can, than the schools that are available to me. Um, mm -hmm. And so every year the question comes up, am I doing it better than the schools would? Um, and it's not necessarily, am I teaching them math and writing and history better than the school would? It's, are the, is the way that they're living as homeschoolers, the way that I want them to live? And are they doing enough intellectual activity to justify mm -hmm. keeping them home? 
Um, so it's again goes back to your values and your parenting, your parenting goals, you know, how you want them to turn out, what you want them to learn. Um, so, you know, the only reason I'm sending my um, high schooler to school is because um, she's not doing the amount of work. Like she, she'll have the intention, you know, she'll say, okay, yeah, sure. I'm going to, I'll give her an assignment. She'll say, okay, I'm going to do it. We'll meet the next week. So where is it? What happened? Um, um, I'll, I'll get it done within the next few days, you know? So it's just, she's not, um, doing enough work for her to be prepared for college like she'll go to college and she'll be like wait i really have to do all this work so my work. husband yeah. and i just felt like you know she, she's she's not going to be prepared so that's why we're sending her to school just so that she has the accountability with someone else mm -hmm. um that she's not taking seriously with me and you know at this point i'm able to just you know sit to her down and make that decision with no hard feelings either way you know like maybe five years ago I would have been like you're not listening to me and why don't you listen to me and you know you don't take me seriously um but you know at this point I'm just like you know like I was saying earlier if you're in a classroom full of people who are doing math you're much more likely to do math than if you're sitting on your couch thinking I should be doing my math you know, yeah. Yeah. it's just harder. Um, yeah. And so, you know, for her, I hope that conventional school will get her more into the mindset of, I just have to do this, even though I don't want mm -hmm. to. Um, and, you know, for my other kids, you know, I have a 13 year old who might be good as an unschooler, you know, she has interests that um, she pursues on her own. She writes books, you know, she's on her second um, volume in a fantasy series, you know, um, and yeah, you know, so she's got things that she'll fill her time with that are beneficial. Um, and so, you know, I don't feel that pressure of like, oh, she's not going to know how to cut it, you know, like if she goes to college, yeah. she won't know what to do. Um, so it just really depends on the child. Um, sometimes I think, you know, it's good that my, my 13 year old went to school for fourth and fifth grade because just having that additional practice of writing by hand and, you know, learning how to take notes and, you know, those crucial years of math where, you know, mm -hmm. you get arithmetic down pat so that you can move on to um, algebra. Sometimes I feel like that is helpful, but my youngest is doing fine. You know, she'll write, she'll do the things she needs to do. So it really just depends on the child. Each child really is unique. And I like what you said about assessing every year, every semester, you have to kind of see what's working and, and adjust your sales and kind of uh, change things. So, so we'll take one more last question. Um, this one I think is different. Uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So we'll end with this one. How uh, did you accommodate for adequate peer engagement for your kids? Um, you can say, probably speak to how homeschooling was a little bit pre-pandemic <laughs> uh, and how it is now, because I know it looks very different. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different. Um, so pre-pandemic, uh, we would be on, you know, uh, local homeschool lists and we would go we would drive as far as a half hour to meet up with groups in parks and um, for field trips and things like that and then we would have groups of people that we would meet up with every week for co-ops classes um, and different things that the parents organized. Um, Post-pandemic we sort of transitioned to online like most people did and that was really hard, you know, it's much harder to have discussions and, you know, interaction online. Um, now, going into this year, I'm not sure what it's going to look like. We're, we're attempting to do in-person outdoors gatherings um, of limited numbers with social distancing and masks. And it's going to be hard. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, I do recommend having at least a weekly thing that the kids look forward to where they're talking with other kids, whether it's online or in person. Um, because, you know, one of the things that can go missing in homeschool is working with other kids. And it doesn't have to look like, you know, sitting down and doing a project. It can just be mm -hmm. playing or, you know, social time. But, um, that engagement is important. So however you can find it these days. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, um, 
I mean, I don't know that you have all the answers or anybody does for that because this is completely new for, yeah. for all of us and for, you know, even veteran homeschoolers is kind mm -hmm. of trying to, because even if we get together, it's, there's always this worry is, right. well, is, is this too many kids or where have mm -hmm. you been? Or is, are we going to really social distance? Are the kids, yeah. they see their friends, it can, you know, are they not going to hug them or, you know, there's right. a lot of, so, um, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, I know it, it looked different before. So you had all those great co-ops and all those yeah. things I used to see. So yeah. Okay. So um, we are a little bit after the hour now. Uh, Autumn, I just really want to thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. It, it, it was amazing to talk to you. And we're so fortunate that you got to like come here and talk with us. Um, and inshallah, when your when your novel is published, I'd love to bring you back and talk about it <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, and um, Autumn's um, website will be listed on our the Facebook stream will always be there. This will be recorded, and um, this is going to go into our podcast that we started. So all the webinars um, get transferred to a really easy audio file, so you can listen to it in the car or anything. So Jazakallah khair. Um, oh, yeah. Autumn, have a great, great school year, inshallah. You too. I hope everyone has a great year. Be encouraged is my, the thing I would say. When I saw the um, flyer that said homeschooling made easy, I was like, oh no. Oh no, that's a misrepresentation. Easy. It's not going to be easy, but it can be worth it for sure. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, Maybe it should have been like uh, time. You know, when they say like something is simple, simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yes, exactly. But I think keeping it simple is kind of yeah. the key is what, what I'm taking away from this is create your own time, make sure, even if it's, you know, before the kids wake up and um, not having low expectations, but putting your priorities, what's, what's right. important to you at the top of the, at the top. So exactly. thank you so exactly. much. Thank You're you. very welcome, and you guys can uh, you can use the contact uh, page on my website if you have questions you want me to answer. I know we didn't get to all of them. I will post answers on my blog. So, so I just can. posted her um, website again in the chat, and then we will post it. It will be there on the Facebook post also. Um, so if you want to get in contact with uh, with Autumn and keep up to date when her book comes out too, inshallah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. As All right. Well. Thank, Thank you, Adam. Adam. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam.